On this episode of Unmute the Voices, I talk with Jeremy Dink, a celebrated pianist, author, and MacArthur Genius Award winner. In this episode, we talk about why we do not discuss as an industry the lived trauma of Black composers and why it's so uncomfortable for us to discuss it as a community. That's right now on Unmute the Voices. Jeremy, welcome to Unmute the Voices. It's a pleasure to have you here on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for joining me today. Most people know you as this legendary pianist. Your Bach recording of, of the partitas is fascinating. It's, it's fabulous. You're having this incredible, enormous career, and you're inspiring to so many people, including myself. But a lot of people don't know that you also have a passion for performing the music of Black composers. Where did that passion come from? Um, well, I think it's it's come out of curiosity. You know, I like to play a very wide range of repertoire, and I don't... I mean, I have played a lot of traditional classical programs, but I am often a little impatient with the normal way that programs are constructed. And, and the repertoire of, of Black composers is, of course, a huge untapped area to think about different styles and different ways of looking at music. And so, you know, it, I'd say I'm probably pretty late to the game, but definitely I've been exploring a lot of that music lately and I've been loving it. And, and it creates a very different... Um, ethos in the recital <laughs> it's, it, 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 yeah, it alters the whole perspective even even in the, you know i used to play this program about rhythm you know it was like a program about syncopation through the ages you know and everything sort of sprang from a couple rags that i was playing you know yeah um uh, and then but then you look back and forth in, in music history and you see all these people you know using the syncopated possibilities of music to enliven things and and it, it really brings an interesting perspective to well, both what music can do and music history and the legacy. What have you learned since diversifying your repertoire, both as an artist and then also as a person? You know, it's, it's funny. Um, there's many things, for example, one learns from ragtime, which is one of my entryways. It's a, it's a style that depends on a lot of conventions, a lot of things that, that are expected, you know, yeah. commercial conventions and kind of musical conventions. And then it has this marvelous way of, of slightly disobeying the conventions or finding ways to be revolutionary or interesting within the pre-existing framework. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a, I think that's one of my favorite things in music to do is that quality of um, taking the thing that everyone accepts and slightly tinkering with it. And I think, well, this is slightly off your topic, but if mm. if you think of someone like one of my heroes, Nina Simone, who I think is one of mm. the greatest pianists and musicians ever to walk the planet, the way she does covers of pre-existing pieces and reinvents them, that kind of musicianship, I think, I, you know, I just not, not only admire, but I think that's the very essence of what I love about music making. Let's say Nina Simone was reincarnated and you got a text message from her ghost or <laughs> from her. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. she said, Jeremy, I'm coming over at three o'clock today mm -hmm. for 30 minutes. And I want to hear some music of my people. What you playing for Nina Simone? What would I play for Nina Simone? Yeah. Oh God, I wouldn't dare to play. 
I wouldn't presume to play for you. To if she sent you a text though and said, She's, "Oh God, hey, yeah. I saw you on CBS on the early morning show on yeah, right. Sunday." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm fascinated by you because, I mean, Nina Simone was a very celebrated black pianist, right? Mm -hmm. Was not uh, welcomed in a lot of different circles, including the classical music circle, yeah. right? And so right. if she said to you, I understand that you're playing the music of my people, of black people, what you playing for Nina? Well, I would play her some of some of the rags that I that I do feel I have something to say about. Uh -huh. At least I've thought about enough to offer her something, and I would welcome her criticism of all kinds. Um, I might play her the Wiggins, which is uh, the Tom Wiggins that I'm playing on the on the program in Seattle. Um, and I'm, I'm working on a piece by Julius Eastman, which I uh, which I've been looking forward to playing for a long time, called Piano Two. I, I'd be curious to see what she might think of that. Yeah, mm. like that. That's really um, that's a curious story of music, and and also someone who is deeply marginalized as as she was in many ways. You know. Yeah, yeah. Although she had a lot more commercial success, obviously. Right. Um, well, yeah. what would you expect that she would hear from? the Eastman piece? What would you want her to hear? You know, um, Nina Simone was such a colossal genius of harmony, <laughs> you know, in my, you know, I think she would be interested in the way that Eastman works with harmonies over, a, you know, his minimalist approach to it and his way of thinking about dissonance and consonance. Um, you know, so much of what she does is, um, take the classical playbook mm -hmm. and bend it to her ends, you know, um, bend it to totally different, in a way, purposes mm -hmm. uh, and in, in the most incredible fashion. Yeah. <laughs> you, you mentioned earlier about Thomas Wiggins, who was arguably one of the greatest black pianists of all time, who... <laughs> was blind and was also a slave and has a very, very um, prolific um, and, and frankly kind of horrific story too um, of, of how his career emerged um, during the height of, of, of classical um, piano repertoire and, and artistry. Talk a little bit about his story and how it influences you as an artist when you're performing his music. Um, you know, as you said, he, he was an enslaved person, right? And he was also, which is a, an amazing story, an astounding commercial success, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'll confess, there's a lot that I don't know that I should know about his life story, but the, the things that I do know, you know, he he basically toured to make money for his owner, right? Yeah. Essentially. And, he and he, and he, he was pimped out and he made a lot of money for him. Uh, and, and also refused freedom as far as I understand. Uh, um, and he wrote this piece, which I'm playing for you, which is a very controversial piece, which is a celebration of the battle of Manassas, the great Confederate victory early in the civil war. Right. Um, and it's impossible to know what his thought process must have been about that, what his feelings must have been. Mm -hmm. But it's a piece of unbelievable uh, violence mm -hmm. <laughs> and invention, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there's something about the piece in the way that it savagely attacks the keyboard as it's depicting the battle um, that really s spoke to me about this whole period that we went through a year and a half ago or whatever it is, this, this spasm of violence in America, once again, centered on, on racial injustice. Um, so th that piece really spoke to me of the moment. And also um, it really connected to me to the Shevsky piece, um, which is similarly about um, enslavement and forced labor mm -hmm. and, and music as a refuge from it. Yeah. Yeah. And and so you as an artist, how have you been inspired or how have you transformed 
um, and your own music making performing this music? Uh, you know, I think what what I what transforms me is um, I you know I grew up with the traditional diet of European dead white male composers mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and don't get me wrong I, I i love a lot of that tradition mm -hmm. right um but in some other ways uh when i play jazz arrangements or or ragtime or, or whatever i do feel there or even music of ives which is so much derived from a whole mix of of uh, popular music from america i do feel some connection to america's history and america's musical quilts <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. or which which is such an amazingly powerful um, quilt of popular and learned music. Much more, in a way, popular music is the what we call popular music is the great music of America, the art music of America, and and so I feel that I'm able to kind of get in touch. I feel really comfortable and happy playing music that lives on that boundary. Mm. That slightly ignores, and I think that's true of a lot of black composers' music too. That they. Um, they maybe by necessity um, write on that boundary mm -hmm. <laughs> or out of expectation, mm -hmm. uh, but you can find such amazing um, expressive potential once you're not confined to one um, style or another. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. It totally makes sense. And, and, yeah. and the way that you're speaking so eloquently about the music of black composers that's written quote in a European kind of, Viennese um, style, I'm curious why it is that more of our white colleagues who are artists, who are presenters, who are organizers, don't program this brilliant music. Why is it that we're not doing that? It's a vast quilt of reasons why, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think to be fair, now a lot of stuff is happening and a lot of audiences are getting into this process mm -hmm. of discovering, you know, that there's more to music than we, we have allowed history to filter down to us. Um, you know, there's a lot of pressure economically to play the pieces that you think all the people are going to like. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of just plain snobbery that we inherited without knowing it. Um, obviously bias, um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of just unconscious history, you know, and and terrible legacy that we, you know, I think everyone's paying a lot closer attention to it now um, than they than they used to. I think it's not that easy yet because of the history to, you know, uh, some some crossover albums work really well, and some are catastrophic. <laughs> catastrophic failures you know what i mean mm -hmm. and to design a really well thought through program I mean, i'm still very early in this process of, of discovery and learning so mm -hmm. i think it's not that easy uh, and and everyone's in a way um you know finding their own way to draw connections between repertoire that we thought didn't belong together in a sense right yeah. because a lot of it is the history that's behind the music, right? Like yeah. Blind Tom or Florence Price or William mm -hmm. Grant Still or George Walker yeah. or even someone as an 18th century composer such as Le Chevalier de Saint-Georges or mm -hmm. um, late 18th century, 19th century composer George Bridgetower. There, right. is a, a, um, there is trauma associated some capacity with all of their lives. And so when we perform the music of these people, we can't just perform the music and not think about the history that is behind the music, the lived experiences of these people from slavery to discrimination to Jim Crow, to women's rights or the lack thereof of women's rights. Mm -hmm. By performing that music, we have to be able to also talk about their stories and also celebrate their, their accomplishments and their perseverance of being able to overcome whatever obstacles they had in that moment. 
what sort of advice can you give to white performers who want to perform the music but of black composers but are afraid of learning about the history or That's, afraid of actually confronting it. It's interesting, yeah, because the, the program I'm doing is obviously kind of almost in your face, almost too in your face about what the history is and what, you know, what the music is. Um, you know, I, I have sympathy for a lot of different aspects of this conversation because I think for a lot of us, one beautiful purpose of music is to create a space where all of us can sort of forget about politics. You know what I mean? Um, mm. at, at the same time, music is inherently political, right? Often. And, and so it's naive to think that we can separate ourselves from it. Yeah, you know, people aren't afraid to talk about Beethoven's history or right Mozart's, Mozart's life story. You know, or, right? or Wagner. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, yeah. Or I think in the case In the case of Wagner, yeah, Shostakovich, you know, what's so great about that is you can think about the history and, and it makes the music even more powerful. If you think about Wagner's story, it makes you slightly queasy, at least it makes me a little queasy about the joys of the music. You know what I mean? One goes with the grain of the music uh, mm -hmm. and one sort of runs against um I think an interesting case is like Mozart, whose who's two big operas are very political, right? Uh, Don Giovanni is about a, you know, a licentious, it's basically me too, right? Don Giovanni is basically a count who, or a nobleman who just wants to sexually assault everyone in sight, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and the, the Marriage of Figaro is about a count who is also a similar problem, right? Uh, and it's about power and injustice, right? Um, so that's woven already into the white repertoire and I don't know why we would feel ashamed to talk about that in, in music of <laughs> black composers. Um, because maybe we're, because maybe white people are, are at the center of creating that trauma. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> right. So, so it's, it's very uncomfortable, obviously, for all of us still. Um, yeah. Yeah. But but the way to actually, if if we're talking about it creating an inclusive culture, an inclusive environment where we can perform the repertoire of Black composers along with Beethoven or Mozart or any of those contemporary composers of the classical period or beyond, we have to, as a culture in the classical music community, be willing to have those uncomfortable conversations and not steer away from it, right? And the reason why I say that is because when we're learning about classical style, we learn about their lives, we learn about the, how their lives influence their writing, et cetera. But when it comes to Black composers as a community within the classical music genre, we don't do that, right? We don't, no, no. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, also it has to be, it has to be done well and artfully and intelligently, you know. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and, Absolutely. and that's, and it's hard because classical music institutions haven't necessarily been set up to do that. And I think also the institutions have some insecurity that they're, they're always being, there are many insecurities, economic insecurity, but also that, you know, we have a reputation for being high and mighty and always lecturing everyone about how great the music is. And so adding more lecturing to the pile, do you know what I mean? <laughs> feels, feels like a dangerous step. So um, because people are uncomfortable. Yeah. They're uncomfortable and they, but you know, music. Some music is made meant to make you uncomfortable, right? A lot of it. <laughs> well, Mahler is supposed to be pretty uncomfortable. You well, know? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of yeah. it is just subjective too, right? right? I mean, because one person might feel uncomfortable, and another person might not feel uncomfortable. They might feel liberated, and I think that's yeah. the case a lot of times with black 
music and we're talking about the stories of these people that black people feel like my stories are being told, I'm being heard, I have a voice now where people can listen and it, the white audience might say, oh my gosh, I feel so uncomfortable with this story, you know? Um, and, and, and so I, I think that's a bit subjective in a sense of um, it's all music and it's all art. But I personally think that we can't actually perform the music without actually uncovering and telling the story, no matter how uncomfortable it is. Um, that's where the real artistry of understanding what the composer meant, what the composer wanted to convey to the listener, that's when the real art starts to happen, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I think so too. And I think um, a lot of the problem for me has to do with the very term classical music mm. and, and the way that we define a, like a distinct walled off province, you know, and I, for me, you know, it's very clear that some of the greatest songs ever written were written by, you know, <laughs> you know um, Tin Pan Alley composers, you know, mm. <laughs> of, of, of all stripes or, um, you know, Joplin tunes. I mean, unbelievable freshness mm. of inspiration. So for me, that's all classical music in the sense of its aspiration, you know, its craft and its, you know, love for the, you know, the possibilities of music. So, but obviously the bifurcation between classical and popular music has a big racial component. And I, I also there's the whole economic injustice of copyright, which I could go into, yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that we didn't really have copyright until a certain point. Right. right. Um, so at this moment when, popular music is splitting off from classical music. Mm -hmm. There's a whole um, exploitative, um, anyway, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 you can see that the problem for me is that, like even deeper, you know, I love classical music, but I hate the term classical music. And I do yeah. wish that. Well, classical wish... music is so broad, right? Because there's so many different periods in which the music exists in, right? But most it's people all, don't know that. That's right. Right. Uh, and and it it's a term that it's many in a way refers to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, almost a thousand years in a way, right? But it, it's a term that also is also so broad to be almost meaningless. And and again has mm -hmm. a kind of distancing thing yeah. that makes people feel uncomfortable when they feel the province is being trod upon yeah <laughs> does so, that make sense to so, try to address your question which is uh, yeah, yeah okay yeah. so then let yeah. me ask you this can a <laughs> i'm i'm a, i'm going to use the word that you don't like classical mm -hmm. or can a performing artist within the entire western cl classical music <laughs> hemisphere try not to use that word classical right can they perform the music of black composers or people of color and say, all lives matter? I love the music, but I'm not gonna say that black lives matter. I'm not gonna say that, um, I'm not gonna denounce police brutality. Can an artist, a white artist specifically do both? Um, I, I mean, I would never say all lives matter. It's a, tr it seems to me, it's a kind of a trolling, um, it's just a horrible reactionary. Um, I don't know of any artists, but they might well exist. I'm sure they do. Uh, I mean, who, the, yeah. the genre in itself is racist. Yeah. Right. So that's why I'm asking that question. Right. Can an artist say, I'm really passionate about Thomas Wiggins. Well, you know, he didn't he didn't want freedom. He wanted to remain a slave. So I'm gonna play his music, but you know, all lives matter. Yeah, that's that's uh feels pretty contradictory to the mm -hmm. spirit of it. Yeah. But there's that <laughs> narrative that's actually going on right now. 
uh -huh. right? Where there are artists who are tokenizing black composers. For instance, George Floyd, there's been this huge kind of shift, right, in our genre where now organizations are saying, oh my gosh, we're a racist organization, or oh my gosh, we, we need to deal with our unconscious and conscious biases, right? Post-George right. Floyd, after the brutal murder that we all witnessed on television, George Floyd wasn't a classical music performer. I don't know if he liked classical music. Or I don't know if he listened to Jeremy Dink's, you know, albums, <laughs> et cetera. You see what I'm saying? Right. So right. why now all of a sudden this shift? Are we tokenizing the music of Black composers now because of this horrific event that has happened? I mean, it's... I think it's a, like a group awareness and it's a sense of a moral outrage, mm -hmm. right? And everyone's struggling to address it in their own ways. And it, you're right, there is a danger of sort of tokenizing and, and doing thoughtless, easy inclusivity, right? Yeah. And I think all of us, um, you know, myself definitely included, um, struggle with that aspect of it and the problems of authenticity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um and, you know and our own hair our own heritage um you know how do i square my own repertoire choices you mm -hmm. know over the years you know and why why did we never think about all this stuff mm -hmm. um i guess as a performer i feel like and for young performers too and i i'm seeing this a lot you know, just invest the patient time to learn some music that makes you a little uncomfortable, <laughs> makes you a little uncomfortable mm -hmm. in one way or another. You know what I mean? And, and the act of having to get up in public and, and play it, you know? Yeah. That's really important. And making thoughtful choices about what pieces you choose, you know, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would say I see, for example, there's a lot of young composers who are looking to composers of color for inspiration right now in a way that um, I don't really remember, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, um, and I would say, like, for example, in the case of uh, Jesse Montgomery, you know, mm -hmm. who we're doing a bunch of, yeah. Um, authenticity of voice is so important, you know. Um, to me, it seems like she has this quality. <laughs> um, and, and I'm so hardened to see people championing that music. Mm -hmm. And... It takes so much time and repetitive attention to build a piece into the repertory. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I hope this isn't too rambling an answer to your question. I, I, no. I, I, I'm I trying to give voice to the sort of struggles that we, you know, obviously neglectful performers are going through to redress. Yeah. Let, let me, let me shed a little bit of light on why I'm asking this mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. one thing within our genre of music is we firmly believe in tradition. In class, in so-called classical music. Yeah. I, I see. I didn't want to say the term. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we ha we're stuck with the term. You know, it's like there's certain things. Yeah. I'm just. Yeah. I, I, I'm creating a space where I'm trying to yeah. be more innovative in my thinking towards not saying that word because I acknowledge mm -hmm. that, and I and I totally agree with you on that. What I was going to say is the reason why I'm asking you these questions, because you are a leading pianist. You you are a pianist that after you and I are gone from this earth, people are going to be reading about the legacy that you leave behind. And that legacy will influence how this community that we engage in will 
think about how they program music, how they engage with audiences, and how they also create structures within the educational system. Yeah, well, that's so that's really, really important. Uh, uh, maybe more, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. why I'm asking these questions because, mm -hmm. because in our field, when you do an audition at Juilliard or Curtis or Boston Conservatory or any of these respected schools here in the country, there's a set repertoire list where you have to play your Beethoven sonata sure, yeah, yeah. and your Mozart sonata or your Bach sonata, right? Mm -hmm. And there's never been any room, regardless of if they ask for a modern or 20th century piece, Black composers have never been a part of that narrative. No, no, they haven't. No. Exactly. Is, Why is that? Because under the, the, the underlying reason is racism. And the narrative that has been perpetrated through our community of the educational system within classical music has been that music's not good. Or no one knows that repertoire. That piece isn't gonna sell concert tickets. That piece no one cares about. Or that story makes me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. yeah. You and your platform of performing the music now of black composers have the opportunity to help change and reform frame the narrative of how educational institutions within our genre of music look at repertoire. You yeah. have that responsibility, whether you I think we do. like yeah. it or not, whether you accept it or not, Jeremy, you're part now of that narrative. And so the yeah. reason why I've been asking you these questions is because how you think and how you engage with the music and the history of Black people who have written in the classical music genre can influence how educational institutions think now about the music of Black composers of seeing Black composers as equals, as seeing their repertoire as valid, as technically challenging and proficient for the 21st century student. In your words, what do you feel the educational system needs to do to become more diverse, become more inclusive, towards including the repertoire of Black composers in their audition repertoire and just in the curriculum? Well, this is a little bit outside. I, I, I think that I actually do think I should be more involved in this, um, far more involved in this important work than, than I am. Um, and you've wandered a little outside of my area of expertise because I'm up playing concerts a lot of the time. And, um, and, and I can think back to, to my musical education. Yeah. You went in, to in Oberlin my... and, 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 you know, Indiana and right. are I, I mean, and you had to audition at those schools. Right. Right. The, the audition repertoire in the classical conservatory world is extremely uncreative. Um, and some of that is to save time. Um, and some of that is just, as you say, you know, bias and prejudice and, you know, just uh, accumulated crap, right? Um, and, and, you know, when I, when I was in high school, you had two choices for, you could go to, you could play an orchestra, which was all basically classical and arrangements of John Williams tunes usually. And then there was band, you know, mm -hmm. and they were both pretty white right yeah. I mean, <laughs> um the repertoire you know um and it does strike me as 
odd that there wouldn't have been other options. And there may be more now, you know, at the high school level for, you know, students of color to get in the door with music that they already love and enjoy. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and someone tweeted at me about that recently. And I, th I think that's absolutely fair that, um, that the music education system, certainly when I was in high school, was oriented towards classical or or sort of whatever band was. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no reason that has to be so, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that would change certainly the ability of those students to get a musical education without feeling they had to be roped into a world that they didn't really like. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and that might really help. And of course, you know, conservatory, I think conservatories are now really working on this. There are so many great pieces that we could hear pianist audition with, you know, the George Walker sonatas are great, mm -hmm. great piece in the repertoire, you know, and I've been looking at them off and on through the pandemic. I'm slightly ashamed that I haven't actually finished learning any of them. Um, I think Steve Beck, uh, if I'm not mistaken, did or just released a record of all of them. Mm -hmm. And that's, I knew his sister, uh, Frances Walker, who taught piano yeah, at, at Oberlin. Oberlin. Yeah, yeah, right. And she never liked me very much. She <laughs> <laughs> but she wrote great, very vivid comments on my student juries. Uh, and she was a real legend around there. Um, uh yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff. Um, even Samuel Coleridge Taylor, you know, I've been yeah. playing that. That's on the program. The, the beautiful arrangements of folk tunes, you know, that that have a little bit of a debt to Brahms and a little bit of a debt to something else, right? And they they draw the boundaries of style quite differently than the ones that we're conditioned to accept in the conventional music history narrative. Um, mm -hmm. But I I definitely feel elementary school, junior high, high school. If we really want to affect change in this world that we live in, that's the place to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you feel that way. I mean, obviously, there's lots of room at the college level to make improvements. I think they're trying. But um, kids fall in love with music education much earlier. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, if that's what we're encouraging, you know, this sort of awareness. Well, and it, you know, my high school orchestra, of course, never played a single piece by a black composer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we, we couldn't really play anything. But you know, right, um, right, yeah. Right. Uh, well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with me on just your your love, your um, your discovery of these pieces by black composers. I appreciate you also um, being vulnerable and, and, and also sharing kind of your thoughts and, and, and kind of your process as, as you are um, learning more about um, this repertoire. I, I think you're a huge inspiration to um, our community of people in, in the classical music world. And, um, and I really appreciate you sharing uh, your views. Oh, I appreciate that too. You know, it, uh, just to say one final thing, it reminds me a little bit, there's a, I, I know this author named Maud Newton, you know, who just released a, well, I just met her on a Zoom, but, you know, she released a whole book about confronting her ancestors' slave-owning past. Right? Mm. It's called Ancestor Trouble. And I think it's a kind of interesting parallel for a lot of our, our you know, classical musicians. We grew up immersed in something that we didn't question. Mm. Um, anyway, I, I would recommend her book for an interesting counter take. What was yeah. your takeaway from that book? The, the complicated process of wrestling with the past and trying to make amends. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. Um, mm. Being willing to listen and, and uh, confront the difficult, the difficult parts. And and I'll add to that too, just from listening to you, um, of reflecting and then evolving. Yeah, I think I think I think we're trying the classical music into, but um, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not it's not as easy as it seems in some ways. But yeah. is evolution ever easy? <laughs> no, no, of course it's not. Of course it's not. Yeah. Right, right, and yeah. so embracing the feeling of 
being uncomfortable and understanding that that has been the lived experience of so many black people who haven't been able to show that in our industry. There are many times where they, we, I'll put myself in, in that category as well, have felt very uncomfortable, but we're not able to express that because we didn't want to get kicked out of school or we didn't want to lose our job or our sure. home or any sort of assets that we might have had. And so um, that's the lived experience of so many people, um, Black people specifically in the classical music field. And so having yeah, these of types of conversations allows the community at large to develop something that I personally feel has been lost in our community for a long time. And that's empathy. Yeah. Right. It's hard. It is hard. Music is music is supposed to be a vehicle for empathy. And um, it's important to keep revisiting what that means. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Jeremy, thank a you pleasure. so much. My pleasure. Thank Thanks you for talking. So much with. for joining me. I really appreciate it. Likewise. Thank you as well to you for watching this episode of Unmute the Voices. Please be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for next time, I hope to see you again soon. Bye for now.